The Littles Big Top on Earth. My neighbors here at Big Top Mall know many tricks. They are all an educated lot, more accomplished than I am. One of my neighbors plays baseball, although she is a chicken. Another drives a fire truck, although he is a rabbit. I used to have a neighbor, a sleek and thoughtful seal, who could balance a ball on her nose from dawn till dusk, her voice like the throaty bark of a dog chained outside in a cold night. Children wished on pennies and tossed them into her plastic pool. They glowed on the bottom like the flat copper stones. The seal was hungry one day, or bored perhaps, so she ate one of the pennies. Mac said she'd be fine. He was mistaken. Mac calls the sh our show the littlest big top on earth. Every day at two, four, and seven, humans fan themselves, drink sodas, applaud, babies wail, Mac dressed like a clown, pedals a tiny bike. A dog named Snickers rides on Stella's back. Stella just sits on a stool. It is a very sturdy stool. I don't do any tricks. Mac says it's enough for me to be me. Stella told me that some circuses move from town to town. They have humans who dangle on ropes, twinning from the tops of the tents. They have grumbling lions with gleaming teeth and a snaking line of elephants each cluck, clutching the limp tail in front of her. The elephants look far off into the distance so they won't see the humans who want to see them. Our circus doesn't migrate. We sit where we are, like an old beast too tired to push on. After our show, humans forage through their stores. A store is where humans buy things they need to survive. At the Big Top Mall, some stores sell new things like balloons and t-shirts and caps to cover the gleaming heads of humans. Some stores sell old things, things that smell dusty and damp and long forgotten. All day, I watch humans scurry from store to store. They pass their green paper, dry as old leaves and smelling of a thousand hands back and forth and back again. They hunt frantically, stalking, pushing, grumbling. Then they leave, clutching bags filled with things, bright things, soft things, big things, but no matter how full the bags, they always come back for more. Humans are ne are clever indeed. They spin pink clouds. You can eat. They build domains with flat waterfalls, but they are lousy hunters. Gone. Some animals live privately, unwatched, but that is not my life. My life is flashing lights and pointing fingers and uninvited visitors. Inches away, humans flatten their little hands against the wall of glass that separates us. The glass says you are this and we are that, and that is how it will always be. Humans leave their fingerprints behind, sticky with candy, slick with sweat. Each night, a weary man comes to wipe them away. Sometimes I press my nose against the glass, my nose print, like your fingerprint, is the first and last and only one. The man wipes the glass and then I am gone. Artist. Here in my domain, I do not have much to do. You can only throw so many me balls at humans before you get bored. A me ball is made by rolling up dung until it's the size of a small apple, then letting it dry. I always keep a few on hand. For some reason, my visitors never seem to carry any. In my domain, I have a tire swing, a baseball, a tiny plastic pool filled with very dirty water, and even an old TV. I have a stuffed toy gorilla too. Julia, the daughter of the weary man who cleans the mall each night, gave it to me. The gorilla has empty eyes and floppy limbs, but I sleep with it every night. I call it Knot Tag. Tag was my twin sister's name. Julia is 10 years old. She has hair like black glass and a wide half moon smile. She and I have a lot in common. We are both great apes and we are both artists. It was Julia who gave me my first crayon. A stubby blue one slipped through the broken spot in my glass along with a folded piece of paper. I knew what to do with it. I'd watch Julia draw. When I dragged the crayon across the paper, it left a trail in its wake like a slithering blue snake. Julia's drawings are wild with color and movement. 
She draws things that aren't real, clouds that smile and cars that swim. She draws until her crayons break and her paper rips. Her pictures are like pieces of a dream. I can't draw dreamy pictures. I never remember my dreams, although I sometimes awaken with my fists clenched and my heart hammering. My drawings seem pale and timid next to Julia's. She draws the ideas in her head. I draw the things in my cage, simple items that fill my days, an apple core, a banana peel, a candy wrapper. I often eat my subjects before I draw them. But even though I draw the same things over and over again, I never get bored with my art. When I'm drawing, that's all I can think about. I don't think about where I am, about yesterday or tomorrow. I just move my crayons across the page. Humans don't always seem to recognize what I've drawn. They squint, cock their heads, murmur. I'll draw a banana, a perfectly lovely banana, and they'll say, it's a yellow airplane or it's a duck without wings. That's all right, I'm not drawing for them. I'm drawing for me. Max soon realized that people will pay for a picture made by a gorilla, even if they don't know what it is. Now I draw every day. My works sell for $20 a piece, 25 with frame at the gift shop near my domain. If I get tired and need a break, I eat my crayons. Shapes and Clouds I think I've always been an artist. Even as a baby, still clinging to my mother, I had an artist's eye. I saw shapes in the clouds and sculptures and the tumbled stones at the bottom of the stream. I grabbed at colors, the crimson flower just out of reach, the ebony bird streaking past. I don't remember much about my early, early life, but I do remember this. Whenever I got the chance, I would dip my fingers into cool mud and use my mother's back for a canvas. She was a patient soul, my mother. Imagination. Someday, I hope I can draw the way Julia draws, imagining worlds that don't yet exist. I know what most humans think. They think gorillas don't have imaginations. They think we don't remember our past or ponder our futures. Come to think of it, I suppose they have a point. Mostly I think about what is, not what could be. I've learned not to get my hopes up. The loneliest gorilla in the world. When the Big Top Mall was first built, it smelled of new paint and fresh hay, and humans came to visit from morning till night. They drifted past my domain like logs on a lazy river. Lately, a day might go by without a single visitor. Max says he's worried. He says, I'm not cute anymore. He says, Ivan, you've lost your magic, old guy. You used to be a hit. It's true that some of my visitors don't linger the way they used to. They stare through the glass. They cluck their tongues. They frown while I watch my TV. He looks lonely, they say. Not long ago, a little boy stood before my glass, tears streaming down his smooth red cheeks. He must be the loneliest gorilla in the world, he said clutching his mother's hand. At times like that, I wish humans could understand me the way I can understand them. It's not so bad, I wanted to tell the little boy. With enough time, you can get used to almost anything. TV. My visitors are often surprised when they see the TV Mac put in my domain. They seem to find it odd, the sight of a gorilla staring at tiny humans in a box. Sometimes I wonder though, isn't the way they stare at me, sitting in my tiny box, just as strange? My TV is old, it doesn't always work, and sometimes days will go by before anyone remembers to turn it on. I'll watch anything, but I'm particularly fond of the cartoons with their bright jungle colors. I especially enjoy it when someone slips on a banana peel. Bob, my dog friend, loves TV almost as much as I do. He prefers to watch professional bowling and cat food commercials. Bob and I have seen many romance movies, too. In a romance, there is much hugging and sometimes face-looking. I have yet to see a single romance starring a gorilla. We also enjoy old Western movies. In a Western, someone always says, This town ain't big enough for the both of us, Sheriff. In a Western, you can tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. And the good guys always win. Bob says Westerns are nothing like real life. The Nature Show. I have been in my domain for 9,855 days, alone. For a while, when I was young and foolish, I thought I was the last gorilla on earth. 
I tried not to dwell on it. Still, it's hard to stay upbeat when you think there are no more of you. Then one night, after I watched a movie about men in black hats with guns and feeble-minded horses, a different show came on. It was not a cartoon, not a romance, not a western. I saw a lush forest. I heard birds murmuring. The grass moved. The trees rustled. Then I saw him. He was a bit threadbare and scrawny and not as good looking as I am, to be honest. But sure enough, he was a gorilla. As suddenly as he appeared, the gorilla vanished. And in his place was a scruffy white animal called, I learned, a polar bear. And then a chubby water creature called a manatee. And then another animal and another. All night, I sat wondering about the gorilla I glimpsed. Where did he live? Would he ever come to visit? If there, if there was a he somewhere, could there be a she as well? Or was it just the two of us in the world, trapped in our own separate boxes? Stella. Stella says she is sure I will see another real live gorilla someday. And I believe her because she is even older than I am and has eyes like black stars and knows more than I will ever know. Stella is a mountain. Next to her, I'm a rock and Bob is a grain of sand. Every night when the stores close and the moon washes the world with milky light, Stella and I talk. We don't have much in common, but we have enough. We are huge and alone, and we both love yogurt raisins. Sometimes Stella tells stories of her childhood, of leafy canopies hidden by mist and the busy songs of flowing water. Unlike me, she recalls every detail of her past. Stella loves the moon with its untroubled smile. I love the feel of the sun on my belly. She says it is quite a belly, my friend. And I say, thank you. And so is yours. We talk, but not too much. Elephants, like gorillas, do not waste words. Stella used to perform in a large and famous circus. And she still does some of those tricks for our show. During one stunt, Stella stands on her hind legs while Snickers jumps on her head. It's hard to stand on your hind legs when you weigh more than 40 men. If you are a circus elephant and you stand on your hind legs while a dog jumps on your head, you get a treat. If you do not, the claw stick comes swinging. Elephant hide is thick as bark on ancient trees, but a claw stick can pierce it like a leaf. Once Stella saw a trainer hit a bull elephant with a claw stick, a bull like a silverback noble contained Calm like a cobra is calm. When the claw stick caught in the buffalo's flesh, he tossed the trainer into the air with his tusks. The man flew, Stella said, like an ugly bird. She never saw the bull again. Stella's trunk. Stella's trunk is a miracle. She can pick up a single peanut with elegant precision, tickle a pass passing mouse, tap the shoulder of a dozing keeper. Her trunk is remarkable but it still can't unlatch the door of her tumble-down domain. Circling Stella's legs are long-ago scars from the chains she wore as a youth. Her bracelets, she calls them. When she worked at a famous circus, Stella had to balance on a pedestal for her most difficult trick. One day, she fell off and injured her foot. When she went lame and lagged behind the other elephants, the circus sold her to Mac. Stella's foot never healed completely. She limps when she walks, and sometimes her foot gets infected when she stands in one place for too long. Last winter, Stella's foot swelled to twice its normal size. She had a fever, and she lay on damp, cold floor of her domain for five days. They were very long days. Even now, I'm not sure she's completely better. She never complains, though, so it's hard to know. At the Big Top Mall, no one bothers with iron shackles. A bristly rope tied to a bolt on the floor is all that's required. They think I'm too old to cause trouble, Stella says. Old age, she says. It's a powerful disguise. <laughs>